Um, I would like to welcome you all to uh, today's um, paper that is going to be delivered by Anayran, who has been uh, a speaker here before, in fact, last year, for those of you who came. Um, he's a lecturer, as you can see, um, in ancient history at Brasenos and St. Anne's Colleges, with this title. Um, he um, is a specialist on the Troas, um, and um, is currently, um, once he gets on the plane, as he says, and writes the conclusion, finishing a book um, with the title The Kingdom of Prying, the Troad between Anatolia and the Aegean, which will be published by uh, Oxford University Press, uh, hopefully very, very soon after you finish this. Um, and he has a wide variety of interests, which includes numismatics, but also um, literature, Hellenistic um, poetry, which is normally quite removed from numismatics, um, except my doctorate was also um, in this very subject, so must be a connection there. But um, we're here primarily to hear him speak about mouse killing Apollo and his coinage, new light on the mint of Alexandria, Troas in the Hellenistic period. I'll turn it over to you now. Um, okay, um, I'd first of all like to um, thank the ANS for having me back to speak again. Um, and it, it's a really nice opportunity to present some research that I'm still working on. Um, and I'd also particularly like to thank um, Uta and John for all their hospitality during my stay. Um, okay. Okay, I think we're going to turn. Okay, so um, this is a particularly scenic photo of Al the site of Alexandria Troas that I took last time I was there. Um, and that gives you a strong impression of what the place is like. You've got these occasional amazing Roman ruins and then a lot of olive groves. Um, and it's actually very difficult to see large parts of the site. Um, so the basic paradox with Alexandria Troas is that it appears to be a large, really important place in the Hellenistic period. But the evidence for it is surprisingly poor. So if we have a look at the literary evidence that we've got for Alexandria Troas in the Hellenistic period, basically we broadly know um, whose sphere of influence it's in at any given time. But um, if you look on the right-hand side, you'll see that um, there are actually precious few specific episodes that we really know about in any detail. And if you press any of these particular episodes, even then you don't actually get that much information. So for example, fighting on the city's territory in the Third Mithridatic War. Um, this is a fragmentary inscription from Upland Mysia um, and a slightly ambiguous passage of Plutarch's Lucullus, so it's not great stuff. If we turn to the inscriptions, um, there are plenty of inscriptions from Alexandria Troas, um, but they're all Roman. Um, so Mariana Rickel uh, did the corpus of inscriptions in 1997, um, and as you can see there, it's less than 5% of the inscriptions are from the Hellenistic period. Um, and since she published that, um, we've had plenty of new and some quite important Roman inscriptions, but we've had absolutely nothing Hellenistic. And if we move to um, the sanctuary of Apollo Smythus, um, which should have plenty of inscriptions, and indeed does, but um, so far as we know, there are a large number of unpublished inscriptions which are going to be published by uh, Tolga Uthan, um, but they all, uh, to the best of my knowledge, are imperial era. So when you go to the site of Apollo Smythus, they've um, done this slightly bizarre thing of uh, wrapping up all the unpublished inscriptions so that you can't copy them illegally. Uh, <laughs> um, Okay, so this is the site of Alexandria Troas. Um, probably the first thing to emphasise is it's massive. Um, so to walk from the temple in the centre down to the village of Dalian and where the harbour is takes a sort of solid 20, 30 minutes. Um, the other thing to note is that um, precisely because the majority of the site is covered by privately owned olive groves, the likelihood of us getting more archaeology um, in the near future isn't particularly strong. Um, now, there, are, there is an active excavation by Munster, but basically everything that's come out of that has, again, been focused on the Rome material rather than the Hellenistic. So when literature, archaeology and epigraphy all fail you, 
um, you turn to numismatics. So in the, this is um, sort of uh, this is a summary of what uh, coinage we have for the third century. So obviously brown is uh, bronze, uh, gray is silver, yellow is gold. Um, and we're able to put this together thanks to um, an article that Andy Meadows published in 2004, which basically resolved a lot of these problems for the third century. Um, and as you'll see, um, so obviously a lot of these things haven't had dye studies done, but just counting the number of issues gives you a rough idea of how large these coinages are. Basically, there's very little civic coinage produced, and the one time that we get a really massive amount of coinage is when um, the Seleucid pretender Antiochus Hierax makes it um, his base of operations in the 230s BC, and then we get a, a really extensive um, silver issue and the one and only issue of gold coinage in the, um, the Hellenistic period. Okay, if we move... So, yes... Um, so during the third century, um, the city's civic symbol is uh, a grazing horse. So um, this is actually taken from, so when Alexandria is originally founded, it's founded out of several nearby cities, one of which is called Neandria, and they get this grazing horse type from Neandria. Um, so uh, here you see what it looks like on a late fourth century coinage of Neandria. Um, these two issues at the bottom are uh, probably minted very shortly after the city is named Alexandria, and there's a, um, uh, an inscribed weight which has the same thing. Um, and this is also the way in which we identify um, uh, issues of Alexandria Troas when they're using royal types. Um, so we've got two sets of posthumous Alexanders, and here's um, some of Antiochus Hierax's output. And in all three cases, you've got this horse, which immediately identifies it. Okay, um, so this is what I've tried to work out for the second first centuries. Um, the f as you can see, you've basically got these um, you've got a, a short-lived uh, issue of posthumous Alexanders quite soon after the Peace of Apamea in 188. And then you've got the coinage that we're actually going to be focusing on today, which is the Apollos Minthus coins. Um, so obviously they're at the top of the table because of the way I've set it out, but really they spread the whole way through um, this table. Um, now, the big thing that changes in this period is that we get a new civic image, which is um, the image of Apollo Smythus. And if you squint, you can see the, the mouse at the bottom. Um, there's going to be a coin which shows that a bit better later. Um, I think these um, date to the 180s, 170s. I'll talk about why I think that later. Um, here are the Apollo Smythus um, silver tetrams and cells. This is the earliest example. And um, again, you see Apollo there. And these are really rubbishy bronzes, which I think date somewhere in the mid-first century, but I'm not really sure. Um, but the point is that this Apollo Smithus image keeps coming up and actually uh, continues right through to the third century AD. So I just pulled these off the ANS website about half an hour ago. Um, there we've got Apollo Smithus in his temple, and here we've got the cult statue itself. So that doesn't get rid of the grazing horse. So at exactly the same time as those bronzers first introduced Apollo Smythus, we also get um, these posthumous Alexanders, and they still have the horse. Um, and if we go down to the mid-2nd century, we've still got the horse. So it's that both these images become the kind of key, key symbols for the city. Um, OK, so... The reason why the Apollo Smythus series is of particular interest and why we can do a lot of the things that I'm going to do in this paper is, um, firstly, it's dated. So if you look in the right field on the reverse there, you'll see a rho and a lambda. That's the era date. Um, and that allows us um, to properly contextualize each issue. So we don't have to guess about where exactly 
it goes and we don't really have to have long complicated arguments about hordes. Um, the other thing is that it's minted continually for over a century. So it's a sort of a snapshot of um, exactly the period of transition to Roman rule. And we can therefore ask lots of interesting questions about the way in which the changes that we see in the series um, may or may not be related to the changes that are going on in the Greek world more generally. Okay, so um, this is a tray of casts in the Bar uh, of, of this series in the Berlin Brandenburg Academy, um, which um, I was there last summer. It was amazingly useful. Um, right, so this is, these are the coins themselves. Um, just briefly uh, introduce you to the types. Obviously, Laureate Apollo, um, notice the way that in these earlier issues, the hair is really tightly curled. That's going to be important. Um, on the reverse, you've got this cult statue. Um, and then the coin is in the name both of Apollo Smythus, so on either side, and then also it has the city ethnic. And then on the right-hand side, we get the era date. On the left-hand side, we get a monogram. And at a particular point in the series, we start getting magistrate names below as well. So between when it starts, probably circa 175, um, and about 118 BC, we've got a series of developments. Um, and I'm briefly going to go through these because they're actually quite useful for identifying forgeries. Um, and once we get down to 118, then it kind of stays the same till the end in 65. So the first one we have, you've got two monograms and you don't have an era date. Um, it's the same obverse die as the first dated coin, so it's probably not that much earlier, but we don't really know the date. Okay, then we get um, an era date, and that's 171 BC. Then, about 20 years later, in 153 BC, we, um, one of the uh, monograms turns into a magistrate's name underneath. Um, about 20 years later, um, the ethnic extends to the full length. And then about 10 years after that, two important changes happen. One, you see that the hair is no longer tightly rolled. It it's just l falls loosely on the neck. Um, and the other thing is the monogram becomes this kind of Ale, which must obviously be short for Alexandria. Um, and it never changes for the rest of the series. So there's been some, it's been doing some other work in the rest of the series, and now it's just indicating the city. Okay, and here's a brief summary of the issues that we have. So um, we've got tetradrams, and as you'll notice, all the things which aren't tetradrams all belong to basically 100 BC and afterwards. So that's one of the things which actually changes in this series. Before that, it's only tetradrams. Um, we've got two rare examples of cystophoric weight coinage. I'm going to come back and talk about those later. Um, one issue of didrams and a handful of drams, which are all in the 70s BC, basically. OK, so that's the coinage. This is the regional context for that coinage. So this is the minting activity of the other cities, which are Alexandria Troas is either responding to or being responded to by the kind of choices that these mints are making. Um, so uh, the coin on of Athena Ilias is a regional association um, uh, jointly run by all the cities in the Troad. Um, and they hold a festival at Ilion. So Ilion doesn't run the thing, but it definitely benefits to the greatest extent from, from this organization. And as you can see, these, um, the style of these coins looks extremely similar to what we've just seen. Um, and um, I argued in an article last year that these probably date to uh, late 180s, early 170s is when they start, um, and that we should probably the series probably ends in the 60s or 50s BC, so it's very long-lasting. Um, the next one is Tenedos. Um, this is a series which um, Francois de Calatay uh, very persuasively argued um, belonged to the first quarter of the um, first century BC. Um, that's still basically true. However, um, a recent horde has shown that what we get 100 to 70 BC is actually a revival of a much shorter-lived coinage in the mid-2nd century. 
Okay, and then we've got um, these examples from Parion, which I'm working on at the moment. Um, this appears to be a similar thing to Tenedos, where there's um, a moment of a brief moment of minting in the like 160s, 150s. Then it goes quiet, and I think at the very least these dates are the 130s BC, but they could actually be down in the first quarter of the second of the first century. Um, then we've got these Abydos coins. Um, again, this is one which only starts really quite late on, so um, you know, a, a, a solid 70 years after Athena, Ilias, and Apollos Minthus. Um, and then finally, um, uh, so if you see these um, come up in auction catalogues, um, they'll say that they start in either in 196 BC or the 160s. Um, I've recently discovered a hoard which, which is actually an IGCH the whole time, um, which you can reconstruct quite a bit of, and it makes it completely clear that these date to the first quarter of the first century BC. So that kind of gives you an idea of the chronological development of coins which are a bit like these Apollo Smithers coins. Okay, so um, I can't make it to the thing tomorrow, but I thought I'd talk about the forgeries that we do have in this series. Um, uh, this is uh, an extremely clever forgery. Um, if it were real, it, I, you would probably take it to be the earliest in the series, because, um, uh, or at the same time as this earliest issue, because you'll see that it's got the two monograms, but it doesn't have the era date. However, there's a whole series of things which are just wrong about this. So most obviously, um, the hair is loose, and... Um, the hair stays tightly curled until at least 128 BC. Um, secondly, if we look at the reverse, um, he's holding a long bow. It should be a recurve bow. Um, that's just, that never changes. Um, the bow is also lacking a kind of a decorative bit at the top. Um, and the right field monogram just looks all wrong and I think is badly copied from um, a quite common monogram that we see on the lifetime Lysimache of Lampsicus. Um, but as I say, I mean, it's quite a smart forgery. Um, and the other one, um, which is much more significant in many respects for the series, um, are these year 138 forgeries. So this was first noticed by Philip Kins in an article um, in 1985, uh, which apparently no one read. Um, <laughs> and um, uh, basically what gives it away is that we have this hybrid um, where it has an obverse die of the city of Myrna, but has a reverse die of Apollos Minthus. Now, obviously, this can't exist. Um, and, of course, if the reverse dies are fake, then any obverse dies uh, which are combined with it must also be fakes. And when you uh, run through that, um, so that's what it looks like. And, yes, as I discovered, well, as me and Uta discovered yesterday when we were having a look in the forgeries cabinet, the ANS actually owns this hybrid. Um, uh, yes, uh, there are four genuine coins for this um, year, and there are 15 fakes. So, um, uh, and these, um, it looks like they were originally produced in Beirut in the early 1970s, and they periodically uh, pop up. Um, and they've uh, gone into some, um, so the one the BNF is in their forgeries cabinet, but as you see, they've been in some sort of quite re reputable sales as well. Um, and of course the important thing here is that this is a relatively small series, there are only 61 tetradrams. So if we accepted those 15 tetradrams, that would increase the size by 25%. Um, another problem is uh, one of the few hordes which uh, has some of these Apollos Minthus coins is from around the time that all these fakes appear on the market um, and says it includes one of these years. So. Um, that's potentially problematic for the rest of that hoard as well. Um, okay, so um, obviously I've completed a die study of this series, um, and that now allows us to um, look at um, how much progress we've made. So if you've seen a table like this before, um, the top line will make sense to you. If you haven't seen a table like this before, then the explanation is at the bottom. Um, so. Von Fritz's study was in 1911, Bellinger's was in um, 1961. Um, the most important figure here really is this one that I've highlighted in the arrow. Um, in general, 
when the ratio of like, the number of coins we have to the number of obverse dies we've observed is above three, that suggests we've got a representative sample. Once you have a representative sample, then you can try to reliably estimate the original number of uh, obverse dies. And you can use two different statistical um, formulas to do that. So this gives us the impression that we actually now know the series pretty well and um, all, is, all is OK. Here, what I've done, though, is um, break down all of the issues that we have um, by year. So you've got decade on the left-hand side, year across the top. And um, the code here is 4D tetradram, 2D didram, D dram C sisterphoros. And green is an issue that um, now exists that Bellinger didn't know about. And if you basically draw a line across the middle, splitting off the second century from the first century, it becomes immediately obvious that we know the first century issues much, much better than the second century. So just averaging across them, as I did in that last table, is clearly going to give us a misleading impression. So in this table, I've now given you the whole series, and then I've split it. <coughs> Uh, 171 to 101 and then 100 to 65 and just as you'd expect from that that last table all of a sudden it turns out that the reason why we thought we knew the series well is because we know the end of the series really well but actually uh, the second century issues there is a lot of problems and even that uh, kind of hides some of the issues so if you dig f if you drill down further into the numbers it transpires that um, four of the nine obverse dies for the second century are only ex represented by one example. So they're massively underrepresented. Equally, eight of the 20 examples of the coins are represented by just one die. So that die is massively overrepresented. So um, this makes it immediately clear that actually we know the second century a lot less well than uh, we initially thought. Um, at the same time, it's worth noting that if you count up how many new issues there are, it's basically we've made as much progress in discovering brand new issues for the second century as we have for the first century. Um, so progress is being made. Um, and if you, um, you know, for the first time, we now have at least one issue for every decade in the second century. So people used to suggest that there was some kind of break in production maybe in the second century, but actually that doesn't seem to be the case um, at all. It's just that it's not those coins aren't turning up nearly as often. Um, and actually the long life of some of the die, so um, my obverse die 4 lasts for at least 26 years, oh sorry, 16 years, um, suggests that the level of production in this period could be very low, which also explains why we don't have as many um, uh, issues represented so far. Equally, um, the other thing that this does point out is that there is a real shift um, between the 2nd and 1st century BC. In the period 165, production is simply higher. They are running through more obverse dyes. So we then have to ask ourselves, well, given the obvious correlation with when Rome is very heavily involved in Asia Minor, is there some kind of connection there? I'll come back to that at the end of the paper. Okay, so, uh, right, so there you can see uh, a view of the Aegean and the reconstructed temple in the village of um, Gulpanar. I'm not quite sure why it's called Rose Spring in Turkish, but never mind. Um, right, who is Apollos Minthus? Um, so, in the uh, introduction to the, in the first kind of 40 lines of the Iliad, um, we are introduced to the, um, tr uh, the Trojan priest Chryses, um, whose daughter has been seized by the Greek king Agamemnon. And um, he goes to Agamemnon and says, um, here's a massive ransom, can I have my daughter back? And Agamemnon, um, because he's a really charming individual, says, no, um, her I will not set free before, th before that um, old age will come on her in, her in our house in Argos, far from her country, okay, we get it, um, as she walks back and forth in front of the loom and shares my bed, um, but go, um, do not anger me so that you may uh, go the safer. Um, Chris Ayes obviously doesn't take that terribly well, um, and as a priest of Apollo, he calls on his um, God to do something about it, 
and he says, hear me, you of the silver bow, who have under your protection, um, and these are a series of places in the southwestern Troad, Chrysae and sacred Scylla, and who, um, and you who rule mightily over Tenedos, and then um, Smynthus, so that's Apollo's epithet. Um, if ever I roofed over a pleasing shrine for you, or if ever I burned uh, to you fat thigh pieces of uh, bulls or goats, fulfill for me this wish. Let the Danaeans pay for my uh, tears by your arrows. Um, and so um, Apollo um, sends a plague against the uh, Greeks, um, and that's the beginning of the Iliad. So quite early on the Greeks try to work out what Smynthus means um, and we actually have something as early as um, the 7th century poet Callinus um, where he thinks it has something to do with mice um, but I would be a bit sceptical about how much the Greeks actually understand of this epithet um, <laughs> because they managed to make it mean both mouse killing and mouse nurturing um, and uh, if you go forward to uh, the kind of uh, kind of second sophistic imperial era writer um, Elian, he has a whole passage about how at the sanctuary of Apollo Smynthus they look after mice and they have mice nesting around the altar. Um, so, uh, in any case, the much more important thing here than whether he's mouse killing or mouse loving um, is that. Um, this is a passage with um, about as sort of eminent a Homeric pedigree as you could realistically come up with. Um, and so it's not surprising. Um, so here are those two passages I just read. There's Strabo. Um, and so the image that we, the statue that we get on the coins um, appears to be a work by Scopas of Par Paros, who's a famous 4th century BC sculptor. Um, and on this one, you can see there go at a mouse quite clearly. Um, so yeah, so the important thing here is is that um, this story gives you direct access to basically the one bit of Homer everyone's definitely read. Um, however, it's a bit more complicated than this. Um, in the classical period, uh, the sanctuary of Apollo Smynthus belongs to the city of Hamaxitos, which is um, down the coast from Alexandria Troas. Um, so at what point does Alexandria Troas somehow end up possessing this cult? Um, the usual answer is basically the last decade of the 4th century. Um, so um, Alexandria Troas was founded in the last decade of the 4th century as um, a Sinoicism, which brought together several uh, uh, surrounding cities into a single place. So the assumption is, at exactly the same time that Neandria became part of Alexandria Troas, and Alexandria began to be able to put a horse on its coin, because that was Neandria's image, at the same time it got Hermaxitus and therefore the sanctuary of Apollo Smynthus. However, that's uh, probably wrong. Um, and there's a good argument, which I'm going to run you through in a second, um, for why actually Hermaxitus probably didn't join until um, after 188, so the Peace of Apamea. So to understand why that is, we need to run through the history of the Samoicism. Okay, so basically there's a simple version and a complex version, and the simple version is probably wrong, and the compl complex version, or some version of it, is probably right. The simple version is that we have this, the foundation of a place originally called Antigonea Troas, after Antigonus the One-Eyed, um, out of six cities in the Troad. Um, King Lysimachus um, then takes the city in 301, he renames it Alexandria, and he releases Skepsis from the Sinoicism. And at this point, um, in the simple version, that's it. You don't have to worry about anything else happening for another 300 years until in the reign of um, uh, Augustus, uh, Tenedos joins the Sinoicism. So the complicated version instead suggests that it's actually a much more piecemeal and drawn out process. Um, and actually that's exactly what we see with Ilion Sinoicism, which kind of gradually grows over the course of 100, 200 years, rather than being kind of a big bang moment. Um, 
why the simple version um, the simple version is essentially derived from the from Strabo who's a geographer writing in the reign of Augustus and probably the reason it's simple is because he's smoothing out the complexities of a process which after all happened 200 years before he's writing and isn't really that relevant to what he's talking about um, so why have we ended up thinking that there is a complex version um, so as so often it's to do with Lou Robert um, who wrote um, a series of articles kind of um, suggesting that various sort of in, um, uh, epigraphic evidence and numismatic evidence suggested um, that places were either not in the Sonoikism to begin with or were leaving and then coming back. Um, and recently, there's a very fine article by Alan Bresson from 2007, where he suggested actually we could extend this argument to Hermaxitus, uh, which is therefore hugely significant for the sanctuary of Apollos Minthus. Um, slightly curiously, this has always been a debate about coins, um, particularly bronze coins. Um, and yet, probably the most useful dating criterion that could have been used to falsify a lot of these claims um, never is used, which is diaxes. So um, we... Um, uh, it's been known for a long time that after Alexander the Great, um, we see a gradual process in which um, diaxes start being adjusted to, uh, of coins start being adjusted to 12 o'clock. And that this is a process which kind of spins out of Syria and, gra and, and you know, goes region by region. And this is very nicely plotted and all the evidence is put together in Francois de Calatay's book on this. And I mean, his, what we basically learn is that for the Hellespont, the Troad, this kind of area, um, it's late third, early second century is really when we see this shift happen. And then once it happens, uh, it's everywhere. So um, I've got an article coming out probably in a week or so's time um, where I've applied this to the problem of, of one particular coinage in the Troad. Um, but actually, we could do this with all of these things. Um, and basically, when you do, it transpires that Louis Robert's right. Um, he just didn't know the best argument for showing that. Um, so in this version, um, we've probably got four cities involved in the initial Sinoicism. And if Hermaxtus and Larissa had anything to do with it, then they left quite early on. But it might just be easier to suggest they were never involved at all. 301, Skepsis is released. So now Alexandria Troas is a Sinoicism of just three cities. Um, at some point, under a Seleucid, which is not that helpful, um, so 281 to 227, we know that the city of Kebren is re-founded as a royal foundation called Antiochia. Um, that probably is happening under Antiochus I or Antiochus II, um, but Hierax is not ruled out. In any case, if we look at the diaxes, we see that sure enough, um, uh, none of Kebron's bronze is adjusted to 12 o'clock, which um, yeah, probably rules out Hierax, but we can't be completely certain. Um, and so that rather does confirm that actually Ant Kebron then leaves the Sinoicism in the first half of the 3rd century. So at that point, uh, Alexandria Trias is a Sinoicism of just two cities. If um, we then separately have the city of Larissa is refounded as Ptolemais, um, again, the diaxes broadly support the idea that this is happening in the 240s, 230s. Um, if we then look at these, um, so Alan Bresson wanted these Hermaxitus coins with Apollo Smythus on them to date to the late 3rd, early 2nd century. Um, but he argued for that on the basis of letter forms, which is a bit problematic to do on coins. Um, but, as it transpires, the diaxes of these coins are adjusted to 12 o'clock, so actually he probably is right about that in any case. So Hermaxitus is still independent as, as late as, say, circa 200. Um, probably the time that Hermaxitus and Larissa eventually join Alexandria Troas, and it finally becomes uh, a five-city Sinoicism, is after the Peace of Apamea. Um, so if that narrative is correct, then it maybe explains why... Uh, Alexandria Troas doesn't seem to be quite so important a place as we might otherwise assume in the third century because it's um, and sorry these are just the coins so there you can see it says Antiochion but these types are exactly the same as Kebron uses autonomously um, this is Larissa but as Ptolemais um, and then here's this Hermaxitus Apollos Minthus coin 
Um, yeah, so it might it might well be that actually Alexandria Trust doesn't really hit its stride till the second century BC, and we've just been slightly um, uh, confused of, on that point because because uh, we haven't got the history of the Sinaiticism in the third century correct. Okay, so. Um, when do we think Alexandria starts putting a polysmythos on its coins? Because that's because the point at which Alexandria Troas does this suggests that um, they've got a hold of the sanctuary, um, and that Hamaxitus is now part of the Sinaiticism. Um, our kind of our bottom date is provided with, by the polysmythos silver coins, um, so that's going to be circa 175. Um, now, Alfred Bellinger, who, who uh, did the last study on these, thought that these bronzes with Apollo Smythus dated to circa 300 because he thought that's when Hamaxtus entered the Sinaiticism. But if they didn't enter then, then actually that argument's wrong. And as we've seen, these coins belong much later. So I, um, I think that these coins probably date very early on because if you look at the rest of the bronzes that um, Alexandria Troas produces in the second century, when there's an opportunity uh, to uh, have stylistic borrowing from the Apollo Smith, the Silver series, it happens. Um, and so the opportunity is having a head of Apollo. Um, so if we just skip through these, oh dear, this is going to make you seasick. Um, right, so you see here that you've um, you know, the style of the Apollo on the bronzes is, is actually pretty close to what you're seeing on the Apollo Smythus silver as well. Whereas on these Apollo Smythus bronze, uh, bronzes, um, that's not the case. So I would put them before this silver series begins. So 180s, 170s. So, okay, that was um, a little bit complicated. But uh, the benefit of doing that is that we then get to put together a narrative of what happens the moment that Alexandria Troas gets its hands on this sanctuary. Um, so they immediately start producing the bronze coinage, which uh, illustrate their link to uh, the sanctuary. Um, they then also put it on these uh, extremely handsome silver tetradrams. Um, uh, by at least 165 BC, we've got um, the city displaying public decrees in the sanctuary. So the earliest one is this one, and it's all of the crowns that cities and leagues have voted for a citizen of um, Alexandria Troas. And the place they're choosing to display what is obviously an extremely important monument is the sanctuary of Apollo Smythus. And then finally, um, the recent excavations on the sanctuary of Apollo Smythus show that the um, temple was completely rebuilt, which we already knew, but it wasn't rebuilt in the late third century. It was rebuilt um, in the third quarter of the second century. Um, so we've got a really focused um, attention on connecting themselves to and um, expanding the importance of this sanctuary precisely after the Peace of Apamea. Uh, if um, if Hamaxitus and this sanctuary had really belonged to uh, Alexandria Troas since the end of the fourth century, why do they only start going on about it now? It makes a little bit more sense that they've only just got their hands on this and now they're making a big deal of it. Okay, so why are they making such a big deal of it? Um, I think the key here is that Alexandria is a city with a very shallow past and a region of deep antiquity. So um, Apollo Smythus remedies that because it's uh, a cult referred to in the first 40 lines of the Iliad. Um, if we look in the context, particularly in the Hellenistic period, um, cities of Troy fiercely contest ownership of the Homeric past. Um, so um, and the main target for a lot of this abuse um, is Ilion, precisely because they've got the best stuff. Um, they can claim to be descendants of the Trojans, um, they are actually living at Troy, and they have access, uh, they possess the Palladion, so the, the cult statue of Athena Ilias. And so as a result, everyone wants to take them down a notch. Um, and uh, um, so we've got uh, Demetrius of Skepsis, um, who was writing the first half of the second century. And we've got two people um, from Alexandria Troas, um, Hestiaea, who wrote a quite remarkable piece of Homeric commentary with large sections on geology in it. Um, 
And then we've got Hegesianax, who's a confidant of Antiochus III. Um, and they all write works which try to dismantle Ilion's claim to the Homeric past. They say, no, Troy was actually built somewhere else. Um, they've got nothing to do with it. Um, and they also just in general denigrate Ilion. So Demetrius uh, claims that the roofs of Ilion, uh, Ilion's houses didn't have any tiles. Um, which uh, the archaeologists were very excited uh, when they were able to disprove this. Um, I don't know it needed to be disproved. I think it's fairly obvious. Um, So, um, but the other thing to remember is this isn't just... uh, it's about prestige, but it's not just about prestige, that there are very real benefits being able to make these claims to Homeric heritage stick. Um, so the coin of Athena Elias is an extremely profitable festival. Um, the Alexandrians presumably want the Smintheia to be an equally profitable festival. Um, also, if you have access to these things, and if you have an important festival and so forth, you can capture the attention of wealthy external powers. Um, and then, of course, there is the point that um, this is a way of establishing prestige within intra-regional politics. Um, and this is something which we see uh, throughout the um, throughout antiquity, and especially on the coins. So, um, Skepsis is, is particularly uh, badly behaved on this front in the imperial period, and they keep nicking myths from other people. Um, okay, um, and so... I want to drill down one more level and say, well, okay, why specifically produce silver tetradrams as a way to celebrate your connection to this cult? Um, So um, it's relatively clear that the um, Apollo Smithus coinage is trying to copy the Athena Ilias coinage. And there's even um, some evidence, and this is based on similarity of monograms, that initially they're relying on the die cutters or the workshop that is doing the Athena Ilias coins and they only later start, they pull it in house. Um, So that inference is based on the fact that um, when we start getting uh, monograms on the Athena Ilias series um, uh, they're kind of similar to the Apollo Smythus ones Um, but that monogram and versions of it keep going for a while, whereas after a few years, it changes to something completely different, and you can kind of detect a few different workshops going on there. Um, So for the Athena Ilias coinage, um, what I've recently argued is um, that the unusual fact of um, it's got low but continual production over a long period of time, it's a very odd combination. Um, The presence of financial magistrates in the exerg on on the reverse and the extremely high artistic standards of the series, at least before the first century BC, um, can all be explained by arguing that the point of the series was um, you, you mint it in order to provide a prestige coinage with which to pay the festival's bills. So they don't need to pay the bills with these coins, but it's a way of kind of, uh, of, um, you know, kind of increasing the prestige of the um, festival um, and and, and advertising um, the goddess. So um, the Apollo Smythus coinage has a very similar profile, so perhaps it should be explained in a a similar way. and that what it's doing is that, if you like, Athe- the coinon of Athena Ilias has set the standard and Apollo Smythus is now trying to meet that with its own uh, similar coinage. Um, and this explanation would account for, again, the low but continual production which we see. Um, uh, so the idea there is that the reason why you get low but continual production is that every year the magistrates need to spend some of these coins but the cost that they're actually having to cover on an annual basis isn't going to be all that great and so that's why sometimes these dies can last really quite a long time um uh, right i've already looked at that there we go okay um so I think that's broadly what's happening in the second century. The question is, um, what happens um, when Rome gets involved? Um, okay, so um, Peter Toneman's got um, qu- 
quite a nice thought experiment um, at the beginning of his chapter on Roman influence on Greek coinage um, in his ANS produced book on the Hellenistic coinage, which you should all read. Um, Imagine for a moment that all written sources for Rome's conquest of the Hellenistic world have been lost. No Polybius, no Livy, no Cicero, no Illyrian Wars, no Treaty of Apamea, no Battle of Pydna. Imagine trying to reconstruct the political history of the Eastern Mediterranean between, say, 229 and 30 BC from the coin evidence alone. What would Rome's arrival in the Greek East look like? Would we be able to spot the emergence of the earliest Roman provinces in the East? Macedonia from 146, Asia from 129, Syria, Cilicia and Bithynia Pontus from 64. Whose impact would be most visible? Sulla, Pompey, Augustus. Um, So... If we just try to identify Roman involvement in Asia Minor from explicit references and coins, then we get a quite odd story. Um, well, so I suppose this isn't really Asia Minor, it's also Greece. You've got the one-off coinage associated with Flamininus's declaration of freedom of the Greeks um, uh, uh, as a sort of a, a complete, um, uh, just on its own in 196 BC. You've then got a few indications that something's up on the Sistophori, which are minted in the province of Asia from the 120s onwards. And then it's only really in the first half of the first century BC that it becomes very clear that there's uh, a new political authority um, in town. However, um, if we then extend uh, our analysis beyond just looking for explicit references to Roman authority on coin types, we discover that a lot of coinages which look civic, so they have civic coin types um, and don't make any references to Rome, behave in unexpected ways. Um, these are coinages which we suspect either wouldn't exist in the first place or wouldn't have taken the form that they did without Roman involvement at some stage in their production. So. These coinages get filed under this catch-all term pseudo-civic, um, but um, that's, it's quite an imprecise way to talk about an extremely varied phenomenon. So to give you a sense of... Um, yes, yeah, so and uh, the article really for, for finding all of these misbehaving or oddly behaving coinages is a nice piece by Francois de Calatai, More Than It Would Seem, which kind of summarises the argument. Um, OK, so here's my go... Uh, at um, what the spectrum of Roman involvement in Greek coinage might look like. Um, Okay, so at one extreme, we've got coins minted at Rome. Um, It's Roman silver, it's Roman authority, it's uh, Roman types, etc. We've then got things like the proconsular um, Sistafori, okay, These types are exactly what we would have seen under the Attalid kingdom in the mid-2nd century, Um, but, you know, it's referring to Metellus on it and and in Latin, so that's quite clear. Then we've got things which have Greek types, but we really strongly suspect that they're minted with Roman silver and that they're minted for Roman purpose. So these absolutely enormous issues of um, Thassus um, coins, which are produced in the... Um, particularly in the second half of the second century and the first half of the first century, and all end up in uh, hordes in um, kind of beyond Thrace, um, would be a kind of a classic example of that. And then we've got um, uh, an image which isn't loading, and and also um, kind of the more problematic examples. So... um, I think sometimes when people talk about pseudo-civic coinage, um, they kind of immediately assume that it's always Roman silver. Um, but I would uh, worry about the idea that we expect the Romans always paid their bills themselves. And um, we can equally imagine situations in which the Roman authorities say to a city, uh, we need 50,000 tetradrams in order to pay our bills, you're going to do that for us, and we're not going to provide the silver. Um, so I very tentatively put an Apollo Smithus coin there. I'm not sure if that's really what's going on, but it's a possibility that we need to consider much more seriously. And then secondly, we've got things like um, the new style Athenian tetradrams. Um, these seem to exist and be uh, minted on the scale and, uh, and, and continually um, that they are, um, for reasons which aren't entirely to do with Rome and which are perfectly sustainable before um, kind of um, before Rome is ex- more explicitly involved, but it's very clear that from time to time they do have a Roman purpose. Um, and there's a nice piece by Francois de Cauteuil on the handout um, about a series of issues which um, 
oddly appear in very large numbers in Macedonian hordes, and he suggests that that's what's going on there. And then finally, um, there's the theoretical possibility of coins which have absolutely nothing to do with Rome. Um, but I'm, I'm hard-pressed to actually think what that might be, apart from very small silver coins and maybe bronze, but even then it gets a bit complicated. So that's the kind of spectrum that we could think about, and then we've got some axes of interpretation. So obviously... Um, we could be talking about phases of Roman involvement. So a coinage might behave in like one of these things at one point and then like another at another point. Um, there's also the possibility that these coinages are doing more than one thing, that they are being minted to meet a Roman purpose, but while they're doing it, they're actually also meeting a civic purpose. Um, and then there's the difference between, um, if you like, what the mint was doing before Rome turned up. Was the mint already producing this stuff and then Rome is just grafting itself onto that production? Um, are these coinages which have been revived from 50 years earlier? Um, or are they things which actually um, aren't even the same mint? They're just imitating um, a quite common coinage from, uh, which used to circulate a lot in the region. Okay, so this is what you saw earlier. Um, Here's where I reckon, so I think Athena, Ilias, and Apollos Minthus were being produced continually, and Rome just grafts them, itself on. Tenedos and I think Parian are examples of revivals. So a mint being told to produce some more stuff, um, and they take the um, types or similar types from earlier. And then we've got these ones which are just a late start, and that's ones where um, you think, well, probably Rome has just asked them to do it straight up, but it could be more complicated than that. So, um, in the case of the Apollos Minthus coinage, um, we've basically got very ambiguous um, indications. Um, and this is the point where, I, uh, in the paper, I'm not totally sure that I've worked this out yet. What we can say is we've got increased production. So, um, in the second century, an obverse die lasts for eight years and it can last for much longer. Um, in the first century, they usually last only for three years. Um, and sometimes the production can be quite uh, rapid. So here's an obverse die which starts being used in 79 and in the same year you see really profound die breaks on the right hand side of the obverse die which suggests that it's already been um, pushed really really hard um, and it's only been in use for six months or something. Um, and these are just the other examples of that die. Um, at the same time, we've also got periods of low production. So given how well we know the, the first half of the, uh, the, the first century series, when we get a gap in production in the 70s, we should probably take that relatively seriously. Um, and it's significant that that is exactly the point when we start seeing drams appear for the first time. Um, also, if this was just a military coinage, the one time that we have military events um, attested on Alexandria's Ter territory in this period is in this period where they don't seem to be minting that much. Um, so that's a bit problematic. What we do, however, know um, from an inscription from 77 BC um, is that Alexandria Troas and all the cities in the coin of Athena Ilias are extremely poor in this mo at this point, and they're basically all experiencing a debt crisis. Um, and we see similar problems in the Athena Ilias series at precisely this point as well. Moreover, from um, four of the member cities of the coinon, um, we see them producing, um, they're basically their large denomination bronze coinages from the second century, which they then hastily overstrike in order to put them back into circulation. And <coughs> in the context of Ionia, Philip Kins thinks that this is basically cities issuing token coinage because they've run out of silla, uh, silver paying for Sulla's indemnity. So that's what these things look like. Um, and they're just, they're, they're very sloppily done. Um, so if the low production in, in the Apollos Minthus series in the 70s really is related to these financial difficulties, then that suggests that one purpose of the stu series still remained to provide coins with which to make payments related to the Sminthea. Um, and actually in that inscription, um, the cities explicitly say the reason they're doing all of these budget cuts is because they want the, s the festival to be celebrated just as it always had been, even though they can't actually afford to do that. Um, 
Okay, the next thing is overstrike. So uh, this is a bit uh, difficult. Um, so Francois de Calatize argued that when we encounter coins overstruck on coinages, which are one, firmly attested Roman coinages, um, and two, um, don't ordinarily appear in hordes in that region um, of the overstriking mint, we should assume that Rome has had some sort of um, hand in moving these coinages from where they were minted to where they were overstruck. So the kind of clear example in this series is We've got this coin, it's overstruck on a coin of Thassos, and you can see in the right-hand um, corner of the reverse um, a little bit of the, the genitive ending of the ethnic. And um, this is from the trays in Berlin, and Imhoff Blumer had already identified the uh, undertype. Um, so that obviously works for that particular issue. Um, but it doesn't necessarily work for, um, in the other two examples that we have of overstrikes, we can't identify the overstrike. Um, and they occur in contexts where we've got reasons to think that silver was in short supply and that the mint was producing coins very rapidly. So it could be that they're to do with emergency circumstances rather than Rome. Um, and so here are those, and there's that one in Vienna. Um, Okay, then, um, I mean, this is equally confusing, um, Sistophoric weight issues. Okay, so Sistophore were the official coinage of the province of Asia. So it's really tempting to associate anyone producing coins on this weight standard with the Roman authorities. However, we also have examples of cities producing Sistophoric coinages when they clearly support Mithridates. So Ephesus does this during the First Mithridatic War, um, and Magnesia on the Mayanda, which is this remarkable coin that came out quite recently, uh, produces Sistophoric weight coins with civic types um, as part of a series which um, is, in terms of its iconography, um, uh, indicating its allegiance with um, Mithridates. Um, so the choice to produce Sistophori seems to be more about where you expect these coins to circulate, so if, i.e. Asia Minor, where they'll be accepted, rather than actually telling you anything about politics. That said, several factors point in the case of Alexandria um, to these being unusual issues, which therefore were perhaps fulfilling a special request from the Roman authorities. So the first thing is that cystophoric weight coinages with civic types are really unusual. Magnesia is basically the other example. Um, this, is, this is an added extra, it's not the mint's core business. Second thing is that the two issues that we've got coincide with the First and Third Mithridatic Wars at times when the city's aligned with Rome. So it's not unreasonable to suggest that Rome has some kind of role in this. Um, and then finally, there are these other indications that the Sistophori lie outside the mint's core business and so are somehow someone else's uh, request. Um, on both occasions, they're minted in parallel with tetradrams rather than instead of tetradrams by a magistrate who also produces tetradrams. Um, and one obverse die is used for both issues with a 17 year gap in between. So it's as if they have kind of, they do this once and they keep it in the back drawer, and then when it's needed again, they have another go. Um, okay, then there's this. So here's a chunk of my um, catalogue. Um, this very odd issue of Thaisios. Um, so this magistrate uses, um, as you see, you've got O12 is used by Docades, and O12 appears again under Bacchios and Antaios in 85. But in the meantime, we've got this other magistrate, Thaisios, who uses a completely different obverse die, which never appears again. Um, the style is pretty obviously poorer than the the other die um, and if you look at the era date the deltas backwards which is an error which we don't otherwise encounter in the series um, and the obverse die also shows signs of intensive minting so we've got die breaks there um, and it's also overstruck um, at the same time um, there's really no reason to think that this is a forgery um, so you can just have a quick look at that and what the difference is between them um, so you see on this Antaeus issue, you're only beginning to get a few die breaks in the right hand uh, side. So I think what this is about is the First Mithridatic War. Um, my reconstruction is the pro-Roman Alexandrians flee the city uh, with the dies in 88 after already having minted the issue of Docades earlier in the year. 
The issue of Thaisios is they're minted under the pro-Mithridatic faction for military purposes, um, and because they, they don't have access to the official dies and perhaps to the you know particularly skilled engravers, um, they don't do that good a job of it, and also they're working very rapidly. Um, and then when the pro-Roman faction returns in 85, they bring the official dies back, and that's why it suddenly uh, gets used again and continues down into 84. So if that's correct, um, the first thing is that it, it actually deals with a completely different issue of what exactly the era on this coins is. Um, some people suggest it was the Seleucid era, which is about 12 years earlier. Um, Obviously, if we go with this reconstruction, it has to be the 301 renaming of Alexandria era. Um, also, it, it suggests that, if again, if that's correct, then um, the output that we see in 85, 84 is probably our best bet of um, a time when we definitely know the Roman authorities uh, were interested, involved, this is a pro-Roman faction in charge, and so forth. And so it's therefore interesting that... Um, we, uh, that we get Sister Fori in, in that year. So, we've certainly got evidence for Roman involvement in this coinage. Um, there's this overall increased production in this period compared to the previous period when Rome definitely wasn't involved. Um, and we've no reason to think that um, all of a sudden um, the festival is going much better, for example. Um, the interest intersecting evidence of overstrikes in 85 and Sistophori in 85 and 68, which when combined with the context of the Thaisios issue, um, indicates a Roman context for the minting activity. Um, so this Roman involvement, if it is there, appears to be periodic rather than continual. So the fact that the series is continually produced throughout this period, not just at the times when it happens to be useful to the Romans. And secondly, the fact that output in the 70s appears to reflect financial difficulties um, the city was facing, um, which we know of from other sources, suggests that um, it's still in part being produced to fulfil its original purpose, which was to provide a prestige coinage with which to meet the expenses of the Smintheia. So if that's correct, then the Apollo Smithus coinage provides an example of a coinage where the line between pseudo-civic and pseudo-civic is blurry, and the resulting coinage reflects a kind of a confluence of distinctively Roman and civic motivations existing side by side within the same coinage. Okay, thank you for listening. <laughs>